Hello all. Today I went on an interesting trip. It took me a while to save up for the plane tickets, but it was worth it. Before I get into too much detail, I should introduce myself. Well, not not really. I'm very paranoid when it comes to the internet, and I won't disclose my real name, so if you want to speak to me, just call me Delmar. I don't know what it is about that word, but I've been digging it lately. Okay, let's get down to business. I recently got plane tickets to Florida and booked to stay at a small hotel near a special location. It was worth the six-hour plane ride for where I was going. If you haven't heard of it, I was planning to visit an abandoned Disney resort called Discovery Island. I did my research, and it was originally known as Treasure Island in the early 70s. The mystery behind the island is very intriguing to me, because it was shut down suddenly in 99. There was a lot of controversy behind the island, and it is commonly accepted that it was the reason behind the island's abandonment. I don't necessarily accept that as easily as others might. Don't get me wrong, I do believe it, but solely because of the fact that there isn't enough information on the subject to prove it. But this theory doesn't settle quite right with me. There isn't any public transportation to the island, so I had to call up a friend to drop me off at the island. It has been about a day since my arrival to Florida, and I've got all my gear ready. I brought a notebook for quick notes, a laptop for typing down documents, a vintage map of the island, which I discovered on the internet, a GPS, and a geocache. If I was going to an abandoned Disney park, I was going to hide a geocache there. I was going to bring a camera, but I had spent all of my money on plane tickets and the hotel reservation. I hopped onto her boat, and we were off. The warm Florida air swerved past my temples and into the roots of my hair, relaxing me. This all went away as soon as the island entered my line of sight. I can't explain it. It was a strange mixture of happiness, excitement, and dread. I couldn't explain why I felt dread, but I did. I also noticed the air got thicker as we reached the island. I told myself it must be the humidity, but in hindsight, that wouldn't really make much sense. The change was too quick. It wasn't gradual enough to be natural. Ignoring it, my buddy pressed on towards the island. Strange. She didn't seem to comment on the things I've noticed. We arrived at the island. Oh, finally! After all the research, I'll finally be able to expose to the world what really happened at this mysterious island. Well, if I find anything to expose, that is. After stepping off her boat, I felt a sense of satisfaction. All of my hard work had led up to this. I waved goodbye to my friend as she left me to my own devices. I looked around for any landmarks. After finding one, I figured out where I was on the map and headed off to where I thought the most plausible places to find information are. The first place I had in mind was the information booth. By the looks of the entrance, this definitely was a Disney park. It was very well crafted and detailed. Most of the display looked sun-damaged and a bit cracked. Some of it, you could say, looked sandblasted. Well, I guess the years of wear and tear from the unforgiving Florida weather took its toll. I continued until I reached what looked like the information booth. The sign was faded and the paint was chipping. It was hanging by a nail, and it obscured my view of the inside. I slid it out of the way. Inside was a perfectly normal information booth, as expected. 
There was an eggshell white desk with assorted tickets on it. It even had some pamphlets mixed in. Taking the liberty of grabbing one of the pamphlets, I ran over to the nearest bench and laid it out. Also faded and water damaged, I deciphered as much of the text as I could and typed it into a Word document. I noticed something funny, though. I had an internet connection. Uh, this place was closed in the 90s. Why would there be free Wi-Fi here? Even if I could explain why there was Wi-Fi, why did it connect without my knowledge? I didn't have auto-connect on or anything. I checked the router name and the IP. The router name was Radio Nick. It didn't display an IP. It seemed to work fine. My internet browser was functioning perfectly. I shrugged it off and decided to take this opportunity to do a little more research. Didn't find anything that I didn't already know. I continued to copy down the contents of the pamphlet. Finishing, I packed up my laptop and continued my journey. It was starting to get dark, which was strange. It was only two, according to my laptop. I called up my friend, and she came and picked me up. I asked her what time it usually got dark in Florida. She told me around this time of year, which was June, by the way, the sun set at roughly 8 to 8.30. Perplexed, I opened up my laptop to see the time was, in fact, 8.30. It literally said 2 o'clock 10 minutes ago. Ugh. Don't, don't, don't freak yourself out, I told myself. It was probably just that sketchy router you connected to that messed up your time. Probably was set to the wrong time zone or something. We arrived at shore, and I took my rental car to the hotel. After typing this up, it really put into perspective how weird it really was. I'll pick up on my exploration tomorrow. I have about four more days on my reservation, and I'm planning on making the best of them. That island is hiding something. Something big. I cannot think of any logical explanation of what I have witnessed today. I feel... impure. That's the only word that comes to mind when describing what I feel. Something... something unholy has to have happened at that island and I feel it's my duty to find out. Okay, before I get into what happened, let me level with you for a second. Here's the information I've got. Remember in the last post when I told you to call me Delmar? You thought that was a completely random name. And in all honesty, I thought so too. Remember the name of that mystery Wi-Fi signal I was getting? It was Radio Nick. Those two names are linked. I dug a little deeper into the story of the island, and I found the original owner of the island was a man by the name of Delmar Nicholson. His nickname was Radio Nick. I couldn't find any records of him, but I did get some information after interviewing some locals. They said that he was the reclusive type. He seemed to have a dark cloud hovering over him at all times. He was antisocial and didn't talk to anybody. I had even heard some claims that he was, get this, a Satanist. A frickin' Satanist! That's a comforting thought while roaming the island previously owned by a frickin' Satanist. But I have heard other claims that he was a Wiccan. Other people said he was a combination of both. Or, as they described it, a Wiccan that believes in the power of Satan. Just keep that in mind when you're reading what happened to me. I had just arrived at the island. You could say I was a little uneasy, 
kind of on edge, armed with the new information. I still got the same feeling of dread as the day before. Only this time I felt sadder than anything. I still entered the park, determined to find out about this whole Radio Nick thing. I planned my route the night before. My first stop was the Explorer's Outpost. Judging by the name, it was some sort of employee area. I couldn't find any info on it, but I'll trust my gut. I headed up to the dock and took a left. There was a building with a thatch roof that had splintered from storms since the closing and walls made out of various wooden sticks. Most of them snapped in half. A small sign stood out front. Explorer's Outpost. Eh, I think I'm in the right place. Before proceeding inside, I looked up and remembered the position of the sun. I walked through what was left of the deteriorating front door into a tropical room. It had an information desk and some benches. All of the ropes used to form lines had fallen over, and the door leading to behind the desk was blown apart, more so than most of the room. It's as if something forced its way into the back. I proceeded with caution into the back room. There was a room with a bunch of filing cabinets inside. Most of them hang open, and half of the files were on the floor. The corner in particular was very dark. Almost unnaturally dark. But something about it made me freeze. Something turned its head around, and its eyes reflected the light coming into the room. The eyes lunged at me. The light revealed it was a vulture. It stopped short of my face, and instead of attacking me, it hovered while waving its wings at me, as if shooing me away. I fell on my back, and the vulture landed on the ground below it. It bowed its head at me. My heart was racing a mile a minute, but that gesture made me feel safe. It looked up at me. It tapped its beak on the face of the cabinet. It read, Real Estate. I opened up the cabinet as the vulture watched. Only about five folders are present. I take them, and the vulture waves its wings. Okay, you've got my attention. It taps its beak on another cabinet. It was the employee records. I take those as well. To my surprise, I turn around for more instructions, and the vulture was gone. I didn't hear it fly away or anything. It was just gone. I wouldn't say I fled the island. I was briskly walking at a pace that you could compare to running in fear. I sat on the dock and waited for my buddy to come pick me up. When she arrived, I was so relieved, but as soon as I stepped onto the boat, this overwhelming feeling of fear and dread overcame me, and I felt really dizzy. I fell over into my buddy's arms and she drove me home. She's a good friend. I took it easy from there. I... I still feel really uneasy and sad about... Well, I don't know. I feel... constricted for some reason. As if there is something looming over me. Something that I couldn't control. Well... Despite my mental condition, I'm still looking into what happened on the island. I should probably start looking through those papers. See you all soon! Guys, this is going to be a very short post, but this is the information I got. It perfectly correlates with what happened to me yesterday. I was looking through those employee records and my suspicions have been confirmed. That Radio Nick guy was a huge Satanist. The employee summary says that after the island was sold to Disney Incorporated, Radio Nick, oh, we'll call him Nicholson, 
applied as an employee after the island construction was completed. They assumed it was because he couldn't bear to leave his beloved island. In the first couple of years, he acted normally. But in his later years, just before the closing, other employees noticed a change in his behavior. Every day, like clockwork, he walked into the jungle by the South American aviary section, not to be seen for a couple of hours. His superiors continually told him this behavior affected his workflow. This eventually led to his termination. Interestingly enough, the employee summary just abruptly ends there. But, handwritten after the end of the summary, was some Russian text. It took me half an hour to decipher the individual symbols, and I finally translated it online into the words, Lucifer's Foul Game. This astonished me and left me a bit confused. I analyzed what it could mean, and I've come to the conclusion this whole thing has to do with birds. The vultures were the key. I've read up that in some cultures, the vulture is considered to be a symbol of good. It makes me think that these vultures are trying to protect me from something, as well as exposing the truth. I also have read that there was a controversy connected to the vultures that took place when the park was still active. Disney employees were killing vultures because they said they were endangering the aviary life on the island. I think the vultures were trying to get rid of the birds because they were connected to something evil. Or someone. Someone by the name of Radio Nick. That's all I've got so far in terms of theories, so if any of you have any critique to my theory or any information that could help, please don't hesitate to contact me. I should also note that I, uh, <laughs> used all my food money to buy a digital camera. Nothing fancy, it's actually quite cheap. I'll be sending pictures if I can. I'll be leaving for the island soon. Wish me luck. Hey guys, this is quote-unquote Delmar's friend. I'm the one who's been boating her back and forth from the island. I have some weird news for you guys. Delmar is currently incapacitated and incapable of getting out of post. She's currently out cold on her hotel bed and she's been having night terrors. I'm worried about what she's been doing out on that island. All I really know is that she's been getting more tense every time I give her a ride. And the most recent ride I gave her, she tried to pass off one of those dollar store disposable digital cameras as something to use on vacation. I let her borrow my camera, and she graciously accepted. After leaving, I was only in my house for 15 minutes before relieving a text message from her. The text said, Come. Now. And then, gibberish. I ignored the gibberish at the end, and raced to my car. When I arrived at the island, I found her face down, out like a light on the ground. After failing to wake her up, I just carried her onto the boat and brought her back to the hospital. The doctor said that she was okay. At first, they thought she was knocked out with a concussion. 
but they examined her and found nothing wrong. So they just prescribed bed rest. So I did just that. I know this blog is really important to her, so I thought that it would be right if I posted something while she's unavailable. Just wanted to update for those of you who follow this blog. She should be awake by tomorrow. I'm done. I'm done. I am never setting foot on that island again. I just got home from Florida. I waited a while before typing this post for the sake of my sanity. Let me... <clears throat> let, let me explain what happened. I had just woken up and I didn't remember anything. My buddy was there and she explained what she saw happen. We talked for a while before she left because she had errands to run. I got comfy in my bed and turned on the TV. The TV illuminated the room and I noticed a camera that my buddy let me borrow. Crap. She forgot it. I get out of bed and pick it up and I turn it on to see if I should charge the battery. It's common courtesy. It was then I noticed that there were only a couple of minutes left on the tape. She gave me a blank tape with about two hours of footage on it. That means I recorded something. That's impossible, though. I had only been on the island for about half an hour. A morbid curiosity overcame me, and I decided to plug it in and watch it. It started out with me waving goodbye to my buddy. I began my hike through the island. The video cut to me at the aviary section of the island. Keep in mind that I don't remember any of this. I was looking around for anything that might answer some questions. I headed for the maintenance area behind the bird exhibits. I closed the door behind me, being the genius that I am. It was somewhat dark in there. Light enough so you can see, but dark enough to make you feel uncomfortable. It was a room full of bags of bird seed. Some ripped open and spilled on the floor. There was a bucket in the corner from what I can see with some scrapers next to it. I could only guess what that's for. I continued on into the dim room when I find a room with a bunch of pedestals scattered on the floor. It seemed like they were ripped off by something and hastily thrown into the back room. I put the camera on a nearby AC unit, and I watch myself pick one of them up. I look surprised and a bit scared. I show the camera the face of the pedestal. It was one of those information pedestals that taught you about the bird it was showcasing. It had an upside-down pentagram burned on it. I paused the tape to clear my head, after which I continued braced for the worst. I picked up another one and show this one to the camera. An upside-down cross with what appears to be a crude Mickey Mouse nailed to it. I put it down slowly, but a bang made me freeze. I stood there for about ten seconds before something made me grab the camera and run. The video cut to me walking around outside. It was dark out now. Using a flashlight to lead the way, I briskly walked through the park. It was eerily quiet. The only sounds I could hear were heavy breathing and quiet footsteps. This continued for about ten minutes. Then the video cut again. This time, I was in what appeared to be a bathroom. I was kneeling on the ground, facing the side of the stall. I was leaning on it as if I had been deprived of strength. 
I turned around towards the camera and started to sob softly. I was feeling uneasy watching this as I don't normally cry. After a bit of sobbing, a voice from the distance, it, it sounded female, simply stated, Stop. In a firm voice. I did as she commanded. I hesitated for a bit, and without warning. I punched a hole through the hard plastic stall wall and began to scream before the video cut to a new scene. This time, I was in a security room. All of the TVs were functioning perfectly. They were all displaying different parts of the island. People were hustling and bustling about the exhibits and displays. The camera zoomed in on the date displayed in the corner. All I could get out of it was... TH 1999. I believe it to be the date of the park's closing. It showed there was one man that climbed over the railing into the jungle. The security feed began to fast forward and stopped after ten seconds of fast forwarding. What I saw next, I. I. I couldn't get out of my mind. All of the people in all of the feeds covered their ears and bent over in agony. The only people that weren't were the employees who started to act ecstatic. I could understand why. If everybody except you and your co-workers began to act like that, I would panic too. They tried things from shaking the people to hitting them. Nothing got them to respond. One of the employees stood up, shouted something at the other employees, and started to run away with them, as, as if away from something. I soon realized what that was when a black mist rolled over the island visitors at a surprising rate. It didn't even seem like mist, just a black mass that consumed the camera's view. I stopped the security feed and backed away to show all of the TVs. Just then, a soft voice spoke from behind. Hello. The camera swerves around to see Snow White staring blankly into the camera. Have you met Nick yet? She undergoes a gruesome transformation. Her eye sockets turned black and, and veins around her eyes splintered from the center. Her eyes turned white and she violently cocked her head to the side with a loud crunch. Her jaw dropped and almost touched her shoulder, and she let out what sounded like a scream. It was so loud, it distorted the audio. She put her arms straight out in front of her and lunged for the camera, before it cut again. I was wandering through what appeared to be a plaza sort of place. I, every once in a while, peered into one of the displays or snack bars, every time. I would find another pentagram burned into the ground on the inside. My silence worried me. Whispering became audible, but it was multiple voices. My footsteps became paired with another, and another, and so on. My walk became a brisk jog, and I stopped checking the displays. I was tempted to just stop the video, but I gathered my courage and pressed on. I abruptly stopped in place, while the whispering and the footsteps grew louder. I quickly turned around to find nothing, while the whispering and the footsteps stopped. I let out a pained sigh of relief, or at least that's what it sounded like. I turned back around again to be greeted by Mickey Mouse. He said, Have you met Nick yet? Mickey began to violently shake, after which his eyes exploded, sending entrails and blood spewing out of his eye sockets. I heard a scream from an unknown voice. Then, halfway through the explosion, the video cuts again. It was lighter out, 
Blood was spattered on the camera, but only a little bit. I was sobbing again, but I was holding the camera and walking through the woods. The camera jerked forward, and I almost dropped it. The camera pointed down to the ground, where an arm was sticking out of it, grabbing my ankle. I pulled away and pulled the rest of the body that belonged to the arm out with it. It was a sickly version of Mowgli, the protagonist from the Jungle Book. He looked gray, and he strangely had more contrast than the rest of the shot. His hair had fallen out, leaving only a couple of dangling strands. I started to scream for help. I dropped the camera, showing a shot of multiple Mowgli's climbing on the trees. They were all barking and yelling. My foot had just escaped the camera's view as all of the Mowgli's pounced onto me, also escaping the camera's view. After that, it got quiet. The camera sat there for roughly 30 seconds. Re-entering view, I stood up and picked up the camera. I walked through the jungle for a while, until I got to a cliff. I had to jump over a railing to get to it. I placed the camera down and walked toward the edge of the cliff. I leaned over the edge and fell. I'm done. I'm done asking questions. I'm done being curious. I'm done looking for answers. I'm done. I refuse to try to analyze anything I saw on that tape. I refuse to further explore the topic. I'm done with this blog. This will be my last post. I know this may be an anticlimactic ending, but I honestly couldn't care. Feel free to speculate and discuss any theories on this, just know that I will not be answering any questions. No, I will not provide the video. I am not wasting my time digitizing it. The only thing I will provide... It's the only picture I found on my digital camera that I brought. Goodbye, all. I'm done. I'm done.